So for the past six weeks, we've been in a series called True Love, reflecting on this idea of pure love or Christian love. And today, we'll finish this little series looking at true love and sex. Everybody say, sex, sex. Oh, you said it out loud. Oh, my word. I'm going to offer a, uh, a brief Christian theology of sex. And then we'll look at an experience Jesus had once, which beautifully shows how to deal with the everyday problems of sex. Now, parents, I'm not going to say anything graphic, but this may, I mean, I don't think there's too many kids in here, but hopefully this will open some doors for you as parents to talk with your kids about these things this afternoon. By the way, the earlier you start talking with your kids about sex, the more normal those talks will be all along. Don't, don't wait to have the sex talk. It's pain, too painful for you and your kid. Just do it all, you know, just talk about it all the time. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for giving us a way to follow. We don't have to be lost trying to figure everything out. So I pray that you would speak words of life and hope to all of us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. As we were singing that song, Living Hope, I was reminded that the church I grew up in was called Living Hope. And I, I have this thing about the statement when people say, don't get your hopes up. As a Christian, you should never say that. You should never say, don't get your hopes up. That's like cursing. It really is. All right, so what is the big deal about sex? Why does it matter so much? And why are we so all over the place as a society with what is good and right about human sexuality? The only thing probably more controversial is COVID. I mean, why is it such a controversial thing? How we behave as sexual beings is a reflection of what we believe about all kinds of things. And what we believe about our sexuality reflects on what we believe about God and therefore about ourselves. People are drawing on, on this huge variety of ever-changing resources to define and continually redefine what makes for healthy sexuality. While as Christians, we prioritize the only source that's been relevant for 2,000 plus years, the scriptures, the written words of God. The Apostle Paul addressed sexuality directly several times, most thoroughly in his letter, his first letter to the Corinthian church. Corinth was the leading commercial center of Greece in 53 AD. Corinth had this reputation of being a having a hyper or a highly sexualized environment, maybe like Netflix or something. The Corinthian temple for the love goddess Aphrodite hosted a thousand plus prostitutes for worship. This is the environment that Paul is writing into. So Paul writes his first letter to the Corinthians to address a variety of situations and after taking a little time to correct these guys who were suing each other, he broadens his correction with this warning. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Your body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with the prostitute? Never. Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord 
is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, or in response to that, honor God with your bodies. Honor God with your sexuality. The design of our bodies for sex, the desire for sex, the activity of sex, it's all his idea. It's so good, it creates human beings. God gives us rules and limits for sex because he knows that we're robbed from the highest enjoyment of it when we misuse or abuse it. The right thing at the wrong time or with the wrong person makes all the difference. So Paul calls out a variety of sins here, including four sexual sins. Sexual immorality, the Greek word is pornea, you know what we get from that, pornography. This is this comprehensive term which means sex outside of a marriage context. Prostitution, that is the giving or receiving of sex for compensation, which includes a whole lot more than paid classic prostitution. Adultery. That is sex with anyone other than your spouse, which Jesus said includes lust, includes even looking at or imagining someone in a sexual way. And homosexuality, sexual activity between people of the same gender in any context. So Paul is calling the Corinthians out on these. He's calling them sin because they miss what's true and pure. These are the things that distort a pure sexuality. They rob us from the true love and the pure sexuality we were created for from sex as God designed it. True love that results in pure sexuality is a blessing to God. It's a blessing to us, married or single. It's a blessing to the world. First of all, pure sexuality is a blessing to God. I know that sounds like a strange. We typically don't think of that. But every sexual thought, every decision, every act is one of honor or dishonor to God. Whether you're single, married, 15, 55, 75, whether you're tempted with heterosexual or homosexual desires, how you respond to those desires, how you behave is what matters. Because how you behave sexually tells a story of what you believe and who you worship. You are not your own, Paul says. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God. Glorify God with your body. In other words, Paul's saying, show some appreciation. Sexual immorality dishonors God and all that he's given us and all that he's forgiven us from. Whereas sexual purity glorifies God. It is this blessing to God. It's not some neutral thing. Pure sexuality is a blessing to ourselves. If you're married, every mutual act of sex within your marriage increases trust. It increases intimacy with your spouse. If you're single, every act of patience and restraint increases your intimacy with Christ. According to the Apostle Paul, who was single, by the way, Paul was single at least at the time he wrote this letter, Singleness allows you to experience an even greater intimacy and trust with God. This added simplicity to life. Those are Paul's words. Whether you're single or married, your sex, your God-given gender, is a distinct part of your identity assigned to you at birth as a part of your custom-built God-likeness. Genesis 1, 26, God created Men and women, and he says this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, livestock, wild animals, everything that moves. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. This is why same-sex activity 
And transgender behavior is such a problem. It rejects the very purposeful design of God who designs and defines our gender as a part of that individual creation. Those things distort and dishonor that likeness of God that we were created for as men and women. All other sins, Paul says, a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against himself. The only true safe sex, not only for our bodies, but for our souls, is that which happens in the context of an exclusive relationship between a married man and woman. So pure sexuality is this blessing to God, it's this blessing to us, and it is a massive witness to the world. Pure sex is a gift to the world. The relationship between a husband and wife is meant to provide the world with this picture of Christ's love and the church. It's meant to provide an example of God's selfless love for all people, this illustration of God's unique, monogamous love for people. A relationship marked by intimacy, fidelity, exclusivity, devotion, and delight. A relationship that follows the example of Christ who loves and serves and sacrifices himself and then who we would be crazy not to submit back to that. So these are a few of the reasons theologically that sex is such a big deal. Through our sexuality, we honor God. We experience God's blessing and we offer this witness to the world. Okay, so what are we going to do with the fact we aren't getting it. <laughs> not just as a society in the church, we are largely not living with a pure sexuality. What are we going to do about this? Even if you are currently, most of you don't have a pure sexual history. What are we going to do about this? Statistically, all of us are either actively involved in or recovering from some type of sexual sin or trauma either at your choice or the choice of others, statistically, all of us are hurting here. And if you've got it all right, congratulations. Like, but most of the people around you are struggling. What are you going to do about that? Let's look at a situation where Jesus responded. And in that one situation, he like covered all aspects of this thing. Follow along with me, if you would, in John chapter 8, starting in verse 2. Jesus is in Jerusalem teaching. It's another week-long Jewish par party, Festival of Tabernacles. This is only three months before he gets killed. Jesus seems to, if you follow the trajectory of Jesus' ministry, he keeps doing these increasingly scandalous things, and finally they can't take it anymore, and they kill him. This is John chapter 8, verse 2. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in the act of adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? So they're using this question as this trap in order to have a basis to accuse him. Someone had used this woman for sex, and now they're using her again as a trap. If Jesus says, go ahead and kill her, he's going, he's going to be accused of being cruel and going against everything that he had been doing the last couple years. If he lets her off the hook and he, and he lets her go, he'd be rejecting the sacred law of Moses and be accused of blasphemy. I would propose that we are on a daily basis tempted to do one of those two things. And instead of doing either one, Jesus won't play the game. He does this very strange thing. But Jesus bent down and he starts to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, 
He straightened up and said to them, Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first. Ah, they get it. Until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. So Jesus, he's an expert at many things. But for a few minutes, I want to focus on his masterful capacity to turn things around. He's modeling for us this thing of repentance. He turns traps into doors. He turns defense into offense. He turns brokenness into beauty. First of all, he turns traps into doors. There's a pretty good chance this woman was a married prostitute. We know, though, she was engaged in some willful sin of her own because Jesus addresses that sin. Jesus may have even recognized her. Whatever the case, if she's a prostitute, she probably got into that profession, not by her own choice. People don't wake up and like, I think I'll be a prostitute today for no reason. So it's this combination of her willful sin and something that's happened to her. Whatever the case, she's trapped and she's in this chronic sexual sin she cannot seem to get out of. And there's no way out until a mob brings her to the healer. And so what does Jesus do? He heals her. He turns the trap that was set to shame her into a a door opened to rescue her, and he can do the very same thing for you. Somebody has walked in here today feeling trapped or stuck. I guarantee it. And it may be a sexual sin. It may be a completely different thing. It might be your fault. It might not be your fault at all. You can't seem to escape from it no matter what you try, and you've tried a lot. And Jesus is saying to you, there is hope. Don't listen to this lie. There's no way out. Jesus went so far as to die to free you from permanent hell, so I can guarantee He cares about all the little hells we find ourselves in. Jesus didn't fight these leaders on the legality of their arrest. And he didn't overlook the need for punishment. There would be punishment. There would be justice. And he would take it on himself. Three months later, he would allow himself to be arrested. He would allow himself to be trapped with nowhere to go. He would allow himself to be thrown around by an angry mob of Jewish leaders. He would allow himself to be shamed and made to stand almost naked. He would allow himself to be crucified like a criminal, which is far worse than being stoned. He took the punishment, this woman, and the punishment all of us deserve for our sin. And guess what? He turned the trap that Satan set for him into a door for all of us. We could go free. You can have a second virginity. You can have a second, third, 50 billion chances. He's not going to stop giving you chances as long as you're breathing. He turns traps into doors. Secondly, he turns defense into offense, attacks from his enemies into attacks against his enemies. He gets in between us and temptation and shame. You know, so Jesus, you know, there are these enemies standing there harassing this woman. I don't know about you, but the, the, the enemy doesn't necessarily need a physical person to harass me all day. You idiot, moron, you're never going to get this right. The, the internal shame 
is equally, if not more painful for all of us. He gets in between us. Worship team, you all can come up here. I remember a time in high school, I told this story one other time, I think. I remember a time in high school when a few of us got into a near street fight with a group of guys in front of the Kmart in Montoursville, Pennsylvania. This is on what we called the Golden Strip because it's where all the stores were. We were, we were facing big trouble until my sister's six foot six farmer boyfriend miraculously drove up. I swear, I don't know where he came from. He gets up, he gets out of his car and he intercedes on our scrawny behalves standing in front of us. What's going on? Everybody's like, nothing. We're just leaving. <laughs> or that's what the other guys were saying. I'm like, yeah, what's going on? <laughs> this is what Jesus does for people in trouble. Imagine this woman for a second. Imagine her standing there alone. All eyes on her. Probably half naked. This mob of men surrounding her with rocks in their hand, ready to kill her. She's dead without Jesus. She is under attack emotionally, physically, spiritually. She's about to die. And what's the first thing Jesus does? What is the very first thing he does? Does he put more attention on her? He gets the attention away from her onto himself. Hey, hey guys, look at me. He distracts her enemies by doing this weird thing of kneeling down and writing in the dirt, and he continues to do that every single day, 24-7, for all of us. Interceding between us and our enemy. So whether you're involved in some kind of sexual sin, or whether it's happened to you without your consent, Jesus is actively working for your defense. I'd also note here, he doesn't really need your help or mine in pointing out all those others who are sinning. He needs us to become intercessors as well. So he turns traps into doors, he turns defense into intercession, and he has this way of turning brokenness into beauty. He's masterful at turning shame into redemption. He doesn't, he doesn't stone her, but he doesn't make light of her sin either. He doesn't suggest that sexual sin doesn't matter. Oh, that's just some old law. It's no big deal. We don't need to worry about that. No, he doesn't do that either. He refuses to play this fight or flight game that the Jewish leaders have invited him into. The game we're invited to every day, particularly with the whole transgender conversation. Every day we're invited into that. And as he often does, he finds this third way. He, he tells her explicitly, listen, dear, leave your life of sin and he protects her and he empowers her to do that. He forgives her without her even asking for it. And he gives her a completely different life from shame to honor, from brokenness to beauty. Kind of makes you want to have Jesus expose your sin too, doesn't it? Go ahead, Jesus. Let's get it all out there. <laughs> Matthew Fulmer, one of our elders, he and I were chatting about this passage and he said something so powerful, I had to write it down. He said, we need a revelation of how our fear of being exposed keeps us stuck and blind to the fact that it's in God's goodness that he wants to expose sin and heal us. What a lie, y'all, that we need to keep our sin somehow secret. You can't heal when you do that. So how about we quit hiding? You know the guy who got away with it? Because, you know, that's the, that's the big thing about the story. You're like, well, where's the other guy? Where's the guy? 
the, you know, we talk about the woman, what happened to the guy? Where's he? He missed out. I bet later he heard about this. He's like, I wish I had just gone to Jesus and gotten forgiven. How about we quit hiding? How about we go to Jesus? How about we voluntarily admit wherever we're missing it or wherever someone else did us wrong? How about we make a lifestyle of confessing things? How about we confess our judgment? How about we confess our judgment for being like the Jewish leaders? Look at these disgusting sinners. It doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to pray some perfect formulaic phrase. You just have to start talking about it with Jesus and with someone you can trust. James says, confess your sins to one another. Confess where you're missing it in life so that what? You can be healed. You can be whole. I'm just telling you all, this habit we have of hiding is killing us. We're going to sing this song, right? What's the song? My Jesus, I love thee. I just want to encourage you, just stay seated. Sing if you're able, if you want, or let the team sing it over you. And then I'll close this after a little bit. Can we have the ministry team come forward? Um, Can we all stand up? Would you mind? And so we pray, you know, for anybody, for any reason. So, you know, the altar is open for prayer. So if you come up for prayer for something like sexual, nobody's going to know. But I just want to encourage you, don't miss the opportunity today to be free. I'm going to give you a benediction from the shortest book in the Bible, the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless, blameless, blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. All right, you're invited to come forward for prayer or be dismissed. God bless you all.